Hey everyone, welcome to the Minerva podcast. It is a rather common view that what is immoral today will be just as immoral in the future. Philosophers such as Hegel or Marx see this very differently though. David Marchbanks' research focuses on the theories of ideology and the implications for morality in Marx and post-Marxism. He thinks that ethical norms are not transcendent but are already there, embodied within our social practice. Critique, he thinks, is the holding to account of practice to its professed ideals. Some people think that morality is a set of rules or duties which have always been true and will always be true. Hegel, Feuerbach and Marx disagree with this. Let's start with Hegel. Why does he think that morality is not at all something fixed? Well, Hegel sees ethical values as social and historical products. He sees the history of philosophy as being at the core of philosophy. We can't understand philosophy without looking at the history. And he thinks there are no permanent sort of single moral questions or answers for that matter. Morality is not a matter of abstract principles, uh, but of forms of what he calls Zittlichkeit, uh, which translates as ethical life. Zitter uh, meaning custom, literally. So the ethical norms are embodied um, concretely in social and historical forms of practice and institutions. To understand this more fully, it might be helpful to understand how Hegel sees reason. Reason we often think of as some kind of universal human faculty where we can just access some ahistorical you know, truth outside of forms of practice. Uh, that's how a lot of Enlightenment philosophy sees it. Hegel disagrees. Hegel sees reason as in the world. So it's not a transcendent force outside of history, outside of society, outside of practice, but it's rather something embodied within human action, within practice, therefore within specific forms of society. So Hegel uses the term Geist, which translates roughly as spirit, to denote a kind of collective consciousness uh, embodied in society and its forms of practice. Geist is a kind of creative activity, a creative energy which strives to become self-conscious um, of itself as spirit. And history, Hegel thinks, is the coming to self-consciousness of this spirit. It's a kind of intersubjective collective consciousness, a bit like the way we talk about the spirit of a nation, for example. Um, it's something which isn't individual, it's not particular to an individual, but is rather shared, intersubjective um, and collective a kind of living soul of the world, or at least of, of the particular society in question. Hegel sees reason, therefore, um, as a spirit, as embodied in the world in forms of practice. So therefore, the products of reason, things you know, we think about, are therefore also part of, part of the social and historical world and not apart from it. And I suppose this alone should make us critical of the morality that we have today, if it's really just a product of society. Exactly. And as we get on to Marx, we'll see exactly why this insight should lead us to be critical, um, not just of forms of morality, but also of the society that give rise to it. And we'll see this when we turn to Feuerbach and particularly Marx. Okay, let's turn to Feuerbach. He comes along and takes over Hegel's idea of alienation. For Hegel, that was an alienation from the spirit. Feuerbach focuses much more on humans themselves. What kind of alienation is he concerned with? Yes, Feuerbach comes to this idea of alienation which Marx really takes forward. For, for Feuerbach, alienation is primarily a matter of religious consciousness. Whereas Hegel had seen alienation as just a necessary part in the self-development, the self-realization of spirit. Uh, just a necessary stage in history. Feuerbach sees it as something rather more negative. Alienation for Feuerbach is the misrecognition of our own essence, of our own human qualities and powers as something alien, something literally external to us, experienced as something separate from us and not our own. So for, for Feuerbach, we misunderstand our own essence. We externalize it um, and project it as something alien above us. So we literally bow down before our own creations. And religion is, is the paradigm here. Um, so for Feuerbach, the, uh, the human essence is inverted, alienated, and projected as something other than human, something inhuman, something supernatural. Feuerbach writes that God is the highest subjectivity of man abstracted from himself. He says religion is the disuniting 
of man from himself. He sets God before him as the antithesis of himself. But actually, you know, God isn't something separate from himself. God is just our own powers, our own qualities, which we don't realize are our own. And this is the essence of, of alienation for Feuerbach, this misrecognition of what are our, our own powers, misunderstood and projected as a supernatural. So Feuerbach was uh, a humanist who sought to kind of recover this human essence. If only we could understand that you know, these supernatural qualities aren't supernatural at all, but are actually our own products, which we're bowing down before. If we, only we could understand that God didn't make man, rather man made God then we could um, recover our, sort of, our true selves and, you know, be free of this alienation. Okay, so Feuerbach says that what is true of God is actually true of ourselves, and then Marx combines this view with Hegel to come up with his own theory of morality. Yes, um, or at least his own approach to morality. I'm not sure we can call it a theory. Um, but certainly Marx combines the Hegelian insight that ethics, ethical values are embodied, they're social and historical products, and they're concrete, they're not some kind of transhistorical concepts outside of history. Um, he combines this with Feuerbach's idea of alienation, but with a particular twist. Whereas Feuerbach only sees alienation and religious alienation as something, a kind of mistake of, of human consciousness, Marx traces it to what he sees as its material basis. So Marx thinks that uh, what he calls false consciousness, this idea of bowing down before our own creations and you know worshipping our own nature as something external, he thinks this has a, has a causal story here. He thinks that this alienation has its roots in a particular form of society. So alienation has its basis in the real state of things, Marx says. A society that's entrapped by religious illusions is not merely mistaken. Um, it's a society that has need of this illusion. He writes very nicely, the religious sentiment is itself a social product. So he says, to abolish religion as the illusory happiness of the people is to demand their real happiness. The demand to give up illusions about existing state of affairs is the demand to give up a state of affairs which needs illusions. The criticism of religion is therefore an embryo, the criticism of the veil of tears, the halo of which is religion. So overcoming alienation can't just be a matter of changing consciousness, thinking correctly. We can't just replace this religion with a humanistic religion, which is what Feuerbach ultimately does. He tries to replace um, the prevailing form of religion, Christianity, with a kind of um, humanistic religion based on happiness, um, and particularly based around the IU relationship. If we discover that our individual happiness depends on the happiness of another, Feuerbach thinks we can just overcome this alienation, form a new humanistic religion. Marx says this is not possible because the inversion, the mistaking of our own essences and qualities as something supernatural, has a real basis, a material basis, in the way that society is organised, in the prevailing forms of practice. So if this religious self-alienation has a material basis, we can't just give it up um, without actually understanding the society. So it turns the attention of philosophy not to consciousness, but to the way the world is. And Marx identifies several causes of this alienation. Um, there's the division of labor, um, basically division of labor into classes. So some people work, some people don't work, Marx thinks. Some people own the means of production. Other people who don't own any means of production have to sell the labor in order to, to, um, to live, basically. Um, also, he identifies the production for the market economy as a source of alienation, because we no longer produce for each other as human beings. We produce in an inhuman way. We don't understand where our products go. Um, we just produce for some people we never even meet. And there's, an, there's a kind of mediation um, where we don't understand the human relation, because production is a human relation, but we experience it in an inhuman way. So with this material basis of alienation, um, Marx combines this with the Hegelian insight that ethical norms are social and historical products to get to the conclusion that if, if morality is um, a matter of something social, historical, and if this society from which morality emerges is something which is materially alienated, not just misunderstood, but actually really in, has contradictions, really is inhuman in some sense, then the morality of the prevailing society will also be, to a large extent, inhuman, um, distorted, illusory. 
So Marx is suspicious of a lot of morality. Although Marx sees um, communism as clearly based in some kind of ethical norms, He's very suspicious of much moral talk. He often dismisses moral ideas. He says um, talk of morality and justice in particular is just ideological nonsense um, that has no relevance at all to the workers' interests and their, their struggle for communism, basically. So, yeah, putting Hegel with Feuerbach, Marx basically gets the conclusion that at least much of our morality is a matter of distortion and illusion. Okay, so Marx is criticizing morality. But where does he take his critique from? Because he too is living in the context of a society and a certain stage in history, which, according to his own theory, determines his values. So how does he manage to go beyond this? Where does he take the values from which he then uses to criticize the current system and morality? Yes, well, this is a fundamental problem in Marxist theory, and there's very various different ways um, that people have understood this. Uh, the problem of ideology is exactly that, that if ethical norms are largely distorted or you know, serve the, the ruling class or legitimize the status quo, then where can we get the moral basis of socialism from? If you know, Marx denies the transhistorical realm of ethical truths, then clearly socialism isn't some absolute moral ideal. Uh, so where does it come from? There are three, or at least three, um, different routes that people have taken here in trying to understand Marx and also not just understand what Marx thinks, but also understand how Marxists or people influenced by Marx today could understand this too. So the first one, the first option would just be to say that he's plain inconsistent. Um, and this is a route taken by what are often called analytical Marxists. That is, uh, Marxists in the analytical tradition um, who basically follow a sort of liberal enlightenment idea of morality and say that Marx ought not to have rejected transhistorical moral truths. They say that moral values must be transcendent, uh, they must not be historical and social products. And since Marx rejects um, these moral you know, absolutes, um, his ethical critique fails because he has, he's undercut his own norms of, of critique. He's just plain inconsistent. The second route is to say that Marx rejects morality entirely, um, but his critique is non-moral. So his critique might be based on certain values and norms which are not moral. Um, the idea is they could be based in a kind of conception of the human good, which has no idea of, of morality, but rather what is good for us. Um, so it could, in that sense, be seen as, some people might say it's ethical without being moral. Other people want to go even further and say, no, the critique is based, and we can understand his critique as based in things like efficiency. Um, and, the, you know, there's a rational reason for um, preferring socialism to capitalism. Um, the third option is to say that Marx's critique is, to use Hegelian language, imminent. And this is the interpretation that I favour, and I'll explain it a bit more um, in, in detail. But the basic idea is that although the norms which Marx uses to criticise capitalist um, society come from capitalist society, and are not somehow moral absolutes outside of history, outside of society, they are nonetheless critical. So values and norms which are embodied in present forms of practice have a potential which outruns their realization by that practice. So it turns out that these ideals which are produced by a particular form of society nonetheless can be critical of that society because the prevailing forms of practice, the institutions of that society fail to fully live up to their own ideals. So imminent critique identifies a discordance between reality and the ideals that it professes to say it doesn't actually live up to its own ideals. And does the same thing happen when he criticizes justice? Yes, I think so. Um, again, there's a big debate on Marx and justice. Um, Marx, whenever he talks about justice, he's most of the time very disparaging of the idea. He talks about it as, as ideological nonsense, as obsolete verbal rubbish in one case. Um, and he says in one place he was moved to laughter at the thought that, that uh, political economy could be reduced to twaddle about justice. So clearly he didn't think much of the term himself and he didn't like using it. He, in fact, in a letter to Engels, he wrote that 
I was obliged to insert two phrases about duty and right into the preamble to the rules of the First International, and also about truth, morality and justice. But he says these are placed in such a way they can do no harm. So clearly he doesn't think much of justice. However, on the other hand, Marx also describes exploitation as theft and as robbery. He talks about the theft of surplus labour time. He says in the contract between the worker and the capitalist, the capitalist steals from the worker because the worker produces far more than they get back in terms of the wage. So they produce a surplus which the capitalist steals. And he is quite um, free in using language of theft, robbery, embezzlement, um, exchange of equivalent with, without equivalent. So. A lot of writers have suggested, well, there's a, clearly a critique of injustice here. How can we talk about theft and robbery in a way that doesn't suggest injustice, right? It suggests that some right has been, has been violated. It suggests that the workers ought to own this product. This surplus which is going to the capitalists belongs rightfully to the workers. So again, we have an apparent inconsistency. Marx rejects justice, yet also seems to need a conception of justice to talk about exploitation as robbery. I think the only way we can make sense adequately of what Marx is doing in a way that's both charitable to Marx but also, but also fair, I think, is to understand his critique of justice in the same way as his general critique of, of moral ideas generally and his own, his own um, idea of how ethical norms can be justified, which is only imminently or internally following Hegel. So Marx says that the capitalist steals from the worker. Um, I suggest this means not that there are some trans-historical principles of justice whereby the worker has an absolute right to the product, the surplus which they produce, which the capitalist steals. Rather, I think we can understand it as meaning that capitalism, in a sense, violates its own ideals. Because capitalism values equality. Uh, Marx says that on the surface, it seems that the, the deal um, between the, the capitalist and the worker um, satisfies this demand. Right? They exchange equivalent for equivalent. The worker exchanges their labor power in return for a wage. It all seems fine. He describes this quite nicely as, on the surface, the, um, the level of exchange. He says there alone rule freedom, Bentham, equality, and property. But when we penetrate this surface level, what looks to be a fair and equal exchange, we realize that the, the worker has nothing to sell but their labor. The capitalist has ownership of means of production. It's not an equal bargaining relationship. Um, therefore, the outcome is not an equal one but one of forced labour. Marx says the labourer is forced to work for the capitalist, forced to produce this surplus, which then is taken away by force. So understanding justice in terms of imminent or an internal critique means we can hold, as I think Marx does, hold capitalism to account to its own ideals. So that on the surface where it looks like um, an exchange that's equal turns out to be unequal, an exchange which looks to be um, free turns out to be forced. Then we can understand um, Marx's critique of capitalist injustice in a way which doesn't mean giving up on the Hegelian insight that ideas of justice, of morality, um, are social and historical products, which doesn't mean, you know, going back to a kind of enlightenment liberalism where these ideals have to be trans-historical outside of society, outside of history. If Marx is right about values being based in society, if he's right about his analysis of society and the economy, how can his predictions which are related to that be mostly wrong? He said that the income gap between capitalists and workers will increase. He said that more and more independent producers will be forced down into the proletariat. He said that the wage of a worker um, will remain at subsistence level, that um, the rate of profit will fall, that capitalism will collapse because of its internal contradictions, that the revolutions will occur in the most industrially advanced countries. All that clearly didn't happen. Um, yeah, Marx clearly was a better critic than he was a prophet. As you say, most or a lot of his predictions just have been widely off the mark. I think it'd be too quick to conclude that therefore his analysis was wrong. Um, certainly not all of it was right, I don't think, but I think it'd be too quick to rule it all out because of these predictions. Um, I think we need to understand that these predictions were based on his 
very um, detailed empirical analysis of capitalism as it was at that time. He was making these predictions on the basis of current trends. The tendency of the rate of profit to fall, for example, is something which isn't peculiar to Marx. In fact, a lot of political economists had been worried about this. Um, it was only Marx that could explain it, or so he thought. So a lot of the predictions Marx made were um, based in sort of trends at the time that were much, you know, stretched much further beyond just Marx. It's clear that a lot of them have just been false. I think it's fair to say he couldn't have imagined the, the welfare state. Um, and this was a big problem for Marxists in the 20th century to understand you know, ideology, how the workers had been won over into capitalism, basically. And the answer some of them gave was that the welfare state had been a kind of a compromise that Marx hadn't envisaged that had lessened the class battle by giving a, a welfare state to the workers, um, particularly after the Second World War, the idea that you know the workers could be placated in some sense with this uh, welfare state. This was an explanation that some Marxists in the 20th century had given. I think there are a lot of predictions of Marxists, particularly when it comes to, um, to communism. I think some of his predictions about capitalism, I think, can still be held up. I mean, although he thought capitalism would fail as a result of its own internal contradictions, um, and he assumed that it would inevitably give rise to, to communism. Um, that's clearly been proved false, I think, at least so far. But I think it'd be rather quick to give up on the idea of crisis. I mean, the current crisis we're going through at the moment, the current economic crisis, has caused quite a few people, I think, to return to Marx, to understand at least how he understood, how he saw crisis um, as at the heart of capitalism. Crisis wasn't an accident for Marx. Crisis was the essence of capitalism. But he clearly seems to have been far too optimistic in thinking that this crisis would inevitably you know, lead to the dissolution of, of the capitalist order and the creation of a communist one. And certainly today, it seems like even if there, there are you know, real sort of crises in capitalism, um, at least in the West, there seems to, to be lacking the, the force that Marx thought would bring about communism. Um, and this is probably one of the predictions which is most um, most wrong, I guess, um, that the, the working class hasn't become a more unified whole that has understood its position and come to oppose the capitalist class. We haven't seen the um, division of society into two opposing camps, as Marx puts it nicely in the Communist Manifesto, workers and capitalists. So the agency that Marx thought would bring about communism, namely the working class, the proletariat, just doesn't seem to be what Marx thought it would be. So I think we can conclude that Marx wasn't right about quite a, quite a few things. Um, in his analysis of capitalism, I think he was an excellent critic, um, but not always the best prophet. Um, he just seemed to have got things wrong. But as I said, I think it's more a case of his generalizations or his predictions were based on generalizations of current trends which today just don't obtain but i don't think this needs to challenge the imminent form of criticism because although capitalist society is clearly not what marx thought it would be um, you know, 150 odd years on since marx we're not living in the world that i think marx thought we would be living in that that much is true but it's also true, I think, that the world is still one which is susceptible to a lot of Marx's critiques. The exploitation has not lessened, um, particularly if we look at an international scale. Exploitation is still a very real issue. Um, alienation does not seem to have lessened. In fact, if you just look at, I think, the number of people um, on medication for supposed mental illness, such as depression, I think it's, it's very clear that alienation, in, in a sense, probably uh, that is wider than the sense that Marx talked about, and yet still uh, in a sense which also has, has links with the way Marx talks about alienation. Alienation is clearly also a real fact um, and has not lessened. So, so long as exploitation and alienation continue to be real problems, I think that although Marx's empirical analysis is not maybe as useful as he hoped it would be, it still, I think, gets to the heart of, of, of capitalism and some of the problems in capitalism. And even if we don't have any confidence in Marx's predictions or his, his ideas about communism inevitably following capitalism and its crises, I think we can still see his criticisms of exploitation, of alienation, 
of the problems of, of capitalism, I think we can still see his critique as of paramount importance for today, even if we can have no faith in his, his solutions. Do you, do you think that there is anything else we can learn from him? Are there any values that are still relevant today? Absolutely. I've been talking about exploitation and alienation and the critiques that Marx gives of these um, phenomena clearly rest on certain values. And given the, um, the sort of critique Marx offers, which I've suggested is internal or imminent critique, these values, if they are values, they must have some real material existence in, you know, they must be being embodied concretely in present forms of social practice. And I think they still are. So take exploitation to start off with. Exploitation, as I've already noted, rests on a, an idea of, of robbery in some sense, of what we could call injustice, even if we don't want to say that's um, a trans-historical norm. So the critique of, of exploitation, of, of theft, um, rests on a notion of, of equality in some sense. So the idea is that, as I said, the, the norm which capitalism claims to live up to, equality, turns out to be um, not lived up to. So we can immediately conclude that Marx values equality in a more full substantive sense than the um, what he calls bourgeois equality, which is claimed to be satisfied by the contract between the worker and the capitalist. And trends in the 20th century and, and more recently um, in moral philosophy and more generally, I think, have moved to a, a more full substantive notion of equality. So the first notions of equality were fairly kind of formal, the idea of being equal before the law, for example, or equality of opportunity, meaning just that people shouldn't be um, barred, there should be no real restrictions. But I think a lot of people now have accepted um, that equality goes beyond this purely formal idea. So if we talk about equality of opportunity, we tend to mean not just the absence of formal restrictions, but also a kind of, not leveling down, but a sense in which that the accidents of birth, the contingencies which um, affect our lives so greatly and for which we can take no responsibility, ought to be in some sense mitigated. So that if someone's born disabled, for example, they ought to not have um, less, less life chances just because they happen to be disabled, which is nothing they've chosen. So even the notion of equality of opportunity now extends beyond that purely formal sense. So we talk about um, equality as an ideal where people are not limited by things outside of their control. And I think this is basically Marx's um, critique of um, capitalist equality, that capitalist equality is purely formal. If Marx's critique is right, if he's right in his descriptions of exploitation, then it's clear that you know, we have a notion, and we're already committed to a notion of equality, which is not realised. I think that's a fundamental um, value and norm which is very, you know, still very much relevant today and which I think calls for a rather different social arrangement. It may be not some of the sort of vague things Marx said about communism and Marx was notoriously vague. Um, most of his writing was dedicated to capitalism rather than communism. But still I think there's a notion of equality which is, which is important there. Also alienation, the critique of alienation similarly rests on a a value or norm which is, I think, still very relevant today, or several actually, several norms. The idea of alienation for Marx has several different dimensions and we're alienated from our products. So the worker produces something, um, but it's not theirs. They produce for someone else. They're forced through the need to survive to produce for someone else. There, we're also alienated from our productive activity, which for Marx is our essentially human capacity, our essentially human um, essence, basically. Our human essence is to be productive, creative beings. Animals, Marx says, produce, but they don't produce consciously. They're not um, creative. Also, we're alienated from each other, Marx thinks. We're alienated from community. So we have, again, here some values which I think are still very relevant. Um, community, for one thing. Um, also, the notion of production being human, being consciously and collectively controlled. Marx is basically committed to a notion of freedom, which is rather like the Kantian idea of autonomy. So Marx thinks before capitalism, we were 
largely held hostage by the blind forces of nature. The advance of capitalism is it frees us from this, um, from these blind forces of nature. But we're now also forced, you know, we're, we're now unfree in the sense that we're ruled by equally blind forces, but of our own creation. So in production for a market economy, production is not human because we don't see the um, result of our production. We don't produce for other human beings. We produce for an inhuman market. Um, we're separated. The way money works furthers this separation. Um, we see ourselves as producing things which have a value in themselves rather than as part of a wider human relationship. So this value of, of freedom and autonomy, and the idea that we ought to be collectively, rationally, consciously controlling our own products rather than being ruled by them, is also, I think, um, a ethical value which is rooted in present practice um, and also is still highly relevant for the critique of present practice even if it might not be um, the rather romantic ideal of communism that Marx often talks about. It's ironic we, we talk about equality, about freedom that's so far from what we have seen in states that claimed to be communist. Absolutely. I think yeah. whenever we talk about Marx it's important to um, differentiate, to distinguish him from the various regimes that have you know, held his name um, and, and waved his banner. Marx clearly, I think, would have been appalled by the things that have been done in his name. Marx's values are very much you know, uh, freedom, um, democracy as well. Marx was a democrat. So you know, when we talk about Marxism, it's important to distinguish the, the theoretical Marx, I suppose, from the, the real, the actual existing Marxist states or so-called Marxist states. Um, as a democrat and as someone who valued freedom, it's it's clear, I think, that Marx would have never have supported um, so much of what's been done under his name. That said, I think it's a little bit too easy um, to just say that you know, communism is an ethical norm and has nothing to do whatsoever with, with these so-called Marxist states. Although Marx clearly would not have supported them as, as someone um, who values democracy, freedom, I think it's very clear Marx wouldn't have supported the Soviet Union, China, etc., and all the other states around the world that claim to be Marxist. I think it's also a bit too easy for some Marxists to say, oh, it's just got nothing to do with them at all. Because that's, that risks, I think, the materialist approach that Marx has. That risks making communism a kind of moral absolute which stands outside of practice, which, as I've said before, um, is, I think, antithetical to Marx's approach. Marx follows Hegel in seeing these things as social and historical. So, on the one hand, these so-called Marxist states clearly did not embody the values that Marx, Marx had. On the other hand, it's too quick to just say they're nothing to do with it. It's rather, I think Marxists or people who claim to be Marxists or follow Marx or inspired by Marx, I think need to study these societies more, cl more closely to understand how that transition happened. Because Marx is always clear that communism was supposed to be the real movement of things, not an ideal which is brought to, to bear on reality. So if what happened was so far from Marx's ideas, I think Marxists need to really study that and understand what happened. 